You're in for a treat. I'm All joined right, by John welcome. Yonides. He is joining us from Stanford University. Pleasure. He's going to give a portion of my research team a talk on COVID-19. When does the pandemic end? What do you need to know about excess death? This talk is full of pearls. And so you don't want to miss this discussion. John Yonides followed by a Q&A. This is really a terrific discussion. So let me cut to the introduction. And um, pretty much, I think, was the genesis of, of a lot of that work in that field. The other thing, John, that I think people forget is I was just talking to somebody about the new uh, Hulu documentary, uh, The Dropout, about Theranos. And I think people forget that even one year before the Wall Street Journal scandal was broken um, uh, about Theranos, that you had written an article in JAMA about stealth research and how uh, sometimes we need to ask tough questions. Uh, and of course, I think that turned out to be vindicated. Um, John, of course, has been a prolific scholar during the COVID-19 pandemic, must have published at least 50 or 60 publications by now um, with a growing citation trail. And I think they are very important papers that cover things from uh, the importance of uh, vaccination, but how to think about vaccination, uh, work on long COVID in kids. I saw really an important paper that came out recently, um, important work on IFR and other sort of uh, uh, things that around that. And so I thought it would be great for, for John to take us through some of his research and thinking on COVID-19 policy. And of course, we're here for it live, but I'll try to make this available to as many people as possible uh, through the virtue of the internet. So John Yonides, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to have you. Thank you, Vinay. It's, uh, it's wonderful to, to join uh, uh, your team for, for this presentation. So uh, let me see if I can pass the IQ test of uh, sharing my screen. Okay, um, so is that uh, visible now? Yes. Full screen? Yes, okay. Uh, title for the presentation, The End of the COVID-19 uh, Pandemic, uh, but this is uh, the short title and I will shortly show you the, the full title. But before I do that, let me start with some uh, disclosures. Um, I have no financial conflicts of interest I have signed no COVID-19 related petitions or declarations. I have no social media. I have no political party affiliations. I have co-authored scientific papers with 6924, 6,924 scientists, according to last time I checked with Scopus. I have many friends and many enemies and uh, thank them both. Um, I, I realized that I need to find a friendometer uh, because conflicts of interest now count if you are friends or have talked with someone or you know, you're in the same campus or in the same city or in the same planet. Um, I, I do try to talk with everyone, uh, uh, even more so with people who I disagree and uh, try to see if they can convince me. And uh, indeed, I have polluted the literature with more than 50 peer-reviewed scientific papers on COVID-19 and a full updated list can be found on my Stanford University webpage. Now, this is the full title of my talk. Um, the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, A, occurred in 2021, uh, B, occurred in 2022, uh, C, will occur in 2022, D, will occur later than 2022, E, will never occur, uh, F, all of the above, G, none of the above. Uh, so let's, let's take a look at that. Um, when does a pandemic end? Uh, well, first of all, we need to say, what is a pandemic? Uh, if, we, if we set that definition, which is still not bulletproof in, in you know, dictionaries of epidemiology, uh, you will see some interesting definitions. And I think clearly we have been dealing with a pandemic, but one option is that uh, the pandemic would end when a large majority of the population has immunity from prior infection or vaccination. For example, you can use the, the standard uh, model approach of uh, asking for more than one minus one over uh, R0. Uh, and then you can say, well, no, and that's not enough. I, I want the number of deaths per week to be not much higher than usual. Uh, or I want the healthcare system not to be overstressed. Or I want the infection fatality rate to be very low for the vast majority of the population. Or I want risk perception by the population to be aligned with reality. And then the risk uh, would be generally very low and people would know that it is very low or when there's no restrictive pandemic measures, uh, or when we don't occupy ourselves with this issue and we don't even think that there's a pandemic, then there's no pandemic in the public space and media. When science ceases to give much emphasis to the concept of the pandemic, when authorities announce 
that the pandemic has ended, um, or uh, when there is no impact any longer on the, of the pandemic and of the measures taken on health, society, economy, civilization, democracy, and everyday life. So when did it end or will it end? Um, if we want more than 70% of the global population to have some immunity, then the pandemic ended probably around mid 2021 and it entered the endemic phase. If we want more than 90% to have some immunity, then probably the pandemic ended in late 2021 uh, or early 2022. If we want more than 90% in each country, location, town and village, this will take a long time. It may never happen, perhaps, if we want everywhere uh, to be widespread. Uh, there may be some locations that, that still evade. If we want deaths and health system stress to return to pre-pandemic levels, we need to define what these pre-pandemic levels are, and we need to have good records. Uh, but probably the pandemic ended in most places in late 2021, early 2022, but there are exceptions. If we want very low risk for the vast majority of the population, then um, again, the pandemic ended in uh, 2021. If we want very low risk and perception of risk aligned with reality for the vast majority of the population, then the pandemic is still present. Actually, it's very present. Um, if we want removal of all restrictive uh, measures, then the pandemic is still really very strong uh, in many, many places. If we want a shift in attention, some attention has shifted away from the pandemic for reasons that unfortunately are even more sad, mostly the invasion of Ukraine and the financial crisis and partly related actually to the pandemic itself after all. And if we want the impact of the pandemic and of our mistakes in dealing with it to be annulled, then the pandemic may take decades to end and may even never end. Let me go through some of the evidence supporting these statements that seem partly contradictory, but maybe they create a picture of, of where we are and where we're heading. Uh, this is a table with uh, results from uh, seroprevalence studies uh, that were done in the second half of uh, 2021 in different locations around the world, uh, pretty much consistently showing extremely high rates of seroprevalence. And, and in these cases, these are people who have antibodies due to vaccination and or prior infection. Um, and have maintained these antibodies. And actually the, the people who have been infected may have some immunity, it's probably larger than uh, what is shown here. So consistently above 70%, in some cases up to 100% in some surveys. And these are also some rough estimates of the proportion of people who were infected at least once in different continents. Uh, we know that people who have been va vaccinated uh, uh, and uh, uh, you can combine these two uh, under assumptions of independence or, or, or not independence. Uh, roughly by the end of uh, uh, 2021 around the world, we have about 80% of the global population had been infected at least once uh, or vaccinated. Um, this is an underestimate, probably it's bigger than that uh, in the US um, data from blood donors from December of last year suggests you know, 95% seroprevalence. So, uh, pretty much we were there even before the advent of the Omicron wave. So if, if you see from that perspective, the Omicron wave can be seen mostly as an endemic wave. The pandemic has finished and now, you know, this year we have Omicron, who knows what's gonna be next year, maybe Omicron again or some variant that has evolved or some, something is very different uh, as we expect to see in uh, uh, even with influenza, for example. What is the number of infections to date? Uh, officially, there's about 510 million recorded cases, but the total infections globally based on seroprevalence data are likely to be in the range of five to nine billion. And uh, many people have been infected more than once now that we're in our end of the third season, practically, you know, third annual round of, uh, of this virus, uh, starting sometime in the fall of 2019. So probably we have four to five billion people, which is 40 to 60 plus percent of the global population have been infected at least once in 2019 to 2022. Um, some have been infected twice. About five billion people globally, 65% have been vaccinated. And this means that more than 7%, within 7 billion of the 8 billion of the global population or, or more than 90% have been vaccinated or infected. And if we take the US, 
We have 257 million vaccinated, which is roughly two thirds of the population, roughly as many infected at least once uh, and about 95% infected or vaccinated. Epidemic waves in early 2022 continue to be a problem, mostly in locations with low vaccination coverage among the elderly, for example, Hong Kong, uh, Eastern Europe and Greece, um, fragile health systems in countries with elderly populations, again, Eastern Europe and Greece, countries that believed in vain that uh, we can just get rid of the virus, uh, zero COVID strategies, uh, China, last example, uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand uh, uh, had to relax and then they had massive infections, but not with high rates of fatalities because they had very good vaccine coverage. Locations with large inequalities and many disadvantaged marginalized citizens. And I think here is where we have a big problem in the US. We're, we're a country that we're both the, the best in the world and also a country that has some of the most disadvantaged citizens in, in the world. Reinfections have now been very common since the advent of the Omicron wave, but they rarely have severe or lethal outcomes. Um, this is a, a review article that we published a couple of months ago with uh, Stefan Pilz uh, from Graz and, uh, and his team. Uh, it's an overview of efficacy and duration of natural and, and uh, hybrid immunity. Uh, hybrid when you have both vaccination and prior infection seems to be better than both. And uh, if you just have one of the two, uh, uh, it doesn't mean that you should not get the vaccinated uh, component. Uh, I think that that's always great to have on board. Uh, but natural immunity, after lots of debate of back and forth, probably is more potent than uh, vaccine-induced immunity. This doesn't mean not to get vaccinated. Now, please don't get me wrong about this, because that would be a major misunderstanding. But I think that, that naturally acquired immunity has not been uh, given the prestige that, uh, that it should have. Uh, and it's unfortunate that people get infected, but this is a virus that is very widely spread, as I said. So lots of people have been infected. Is it different in the Omicron era and beyond? Um, well, it is different in that we have far more infections than we had in the Delta wave. Uh, this is a study that we completed with uh, uh, data on 2 million people in, uh, in Vojvodina. Uh, with uh, colleagues uh, who are in the public health uh, department of that province. Uh, and uh, this is the, the risk of reinfection in that uh, population of, of 2 million people where there's about a quarter of a million documented infections. And you can see that uh, there's a substantial increase in risk uh, after the 12 to 15 month uh, uh, window. Uh, and of course, reinfections are not all counted here. So we have almost 30% risk at 21 months after the original infection. If you have twofold under counting, then that's uh, more than 50%. If it's threefold under counting, then this is about 80% of people who got reinfected. So that's, that's very, very high. And the big question is, how bad is that? Well, reinfections are much less severe compared to the primary infections. So hospitalization risk is about four times lower and death risk is about 10 times lower. Uh, in, in fact, in this entire population, there were only 20 COVID-19 deaths due to reinfection, which is very, very few uh, compared to what we saw with uh, primary infections. A big question is how far away from normal did COVID-19 take us? It was a major crisis, there's no doubt about it. It was a pandemic, I think that there's no doubt about it, even though people would contest what are the exact definitions here. But I think it is interesting to try to compare the impact of COVID-19 versus other pandemics uh, since the beginning of the 20th century, and also have some comparison against seasonal flu. I think people get very excited when uh, they see the same uh, ent these entities in the same slide, but I think it's important to put them in the same slide to try to see how much worse uh, was that. This is a, a table from my recent paper and uh, it builds on prior data from a number of assessments that have been done with empirical evidence, but also with a lot of extrapolations and imputations and simulations for all the past pandemics and also for seasonal flu. It's uh, really surprising now that we have about half a million papers on COVID-19 that we had so much uncertainty about what influenza was doing every year and even more so about what it did during the pandemic years. So I'm just trying to plot here uh, in that same slide, 
the proportion of the global population dying, the age distribution of deaths in big bins of less than 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 65, and more than 65, the life expectancy at uh, birth at that time, and an estimate of the relative size that tries to accommodate the, the loss of person years of, of life without really being able to accommodate the quality or disability adjusted life years lost, because obviously that will be very important, but we have very, very thin data, even for making calculations of just person years, uh, let alone uh, quality or disability uh, adjusted uh, life years. But I, I will show you some data about how that might look like. So the basic conclusion is that 1918, 1920 was probably a completely different league. Uh, the uh, proportion of the global population dying was uh, uh, one to 6% or, or more. Uh, it was mostly very young people with average age of 27. And uh, the relative size compared to an equivalent number of seasonal flu seasons uh, is about 100 to 1,000 fold. Now, when you look at that number, you start wondering, is that really true? Could it be? Could it have been that big? And I have to say that our data are very weak. There's, there's lots of uncertainty. There's lots of uh, a wide range in these calculations. And perhaps we are wrong to think that it was that bad. Maybe it was a, a bit less or substantially less. And also we need to take into account that in 1918, we didn't have many of the advances like mechanical ventilation that can make a difference in being able to support life and save uh, a number of lives that we have nowadays. 1957, 1968, 2009 seem to be roughly in the same ballpark, about 1.5 to four times the equivalent of uh, three seasons of, uh, of uh, typical flu. And uh, again, very substantial uncertainty, very different distributions of the age of fatalities, far fewer fatalities in 2009, but far younger people compared to uh, 1968. Um, 1957, somewhere in the middle in terms of both. Uh, so again, a lot of young people, but less uh, absolute number of deaths compared to 1968. COVID-19, um, I would try to separate here two estimates. One is deaths due to infection and the other is excess deaths. And I try to do this because in contrast to previous pandemics, I think that in COVID-19, there's clearly a, a disconnect between the number of deaths due to infection directly and the total excess deaths. I think in previous pandemics, these two numbers probably were very close. People who died or died more than is typical probably died largely, almost exclusively because of the infection. But in the case of COVID-19, we had many, many disruptions, both in healthcare and health systems and in other functions of life, society, economy, um, all aspects of, of healthcare. We had draconian measures that had not been used really in the past in other pandemics. So I think that the excess deaths and due to infection deaths are not likely to be the same. I think the excess deaths are likely to be far more. So these are some estimates again. And I think that if you look at deaths due to infection, they're probably in the same ballpark in terms of relative size of person years lost compared to the available person years in the population as 1957 and 1968. But it could be more, it could be less. And excess deaths probably are substantially more. And I will show you what we know about it or what we impute about it and what we still need to learn. This is looking at uh, Europe, the Euromonitor, Euromomo data in the first three months of 2022. Uh, this is all deaths uh, across the, universe, the, uh, the European countries that are being tracked uh, in the system. And I, I'm plotting here 2022 versus uh, uh, 2018 and 2019. So you see that 2022 is uh, uh, pretty much at the same level as 2019, which was an excellent year. And it is much better compared to 2018. So you know, for these European countries, uh, the total deaths uh, do not seem to be unusual. But of course, there's differences from one country to another. Uh, this is two very highly cited and very prominent evaluations of excess deaths that have been published in eLife and in Lancet, uh, both of them uh, by excellent colleagues uh, and very meticulously done uh, with models that, you know, of course, many people will disagree about the details, but they're valiant efforts. And I'm focusing here 
on the estimates of excess deaths in high-income countries uh, according to the Lancet classification. So that includes high-income countries in Western Europe, in Americas, uh, and uh, a couple of uh, uh, high-income countries in the Asia Pacific uh, region. They leave out uh, what would be uh, high-income countries in Eastern Europe that you know, have pretty high excess deaths, uh, far more uh, compared to those recorded. And the correlation here is very poor. It's actually a negative correlation if you compare these two efforts by, by two knowledgeable uh, teams. Uh, so th that makes me a, a, a bit uneasy because these are the countries that we have the best data. Uh, if you look at other countries, we don't even have death registration in most of them. Uh, we <laughs> have uh, systems that are struggling to improve death registration, but no one has any clue of what happened during the pandemic. Did they get worse in registering deaths? Did they get better? Because you know, suddenly death became the main theme of our life. It's, it's very, very hard to tell. But excess death calculations depend on modeling. Uh, this is some uh, work that I'm doing with uh, Michael Levitt uh, and uh, with uh, 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 his uh, uh, emphasis on, on excess deaths. Uh, and uh, uh, we try to uh, assess excess deaths for the entire two year period of 2021, 2022, 2020, 2021, in 33 high income countries with very meticulous available weekly mortality data according to age strata uh, in mortality org. That uh, means a total population of roughly 1 billion and with 1.9 million COVID-19 deaths uh, recorded during this period. The three published modeling calculations are 2 million deaths uh, with uh, eLife for excess, 2.2 with Economist, and 2.8 with uh, Lancet uh, IHME uh, models. And none of these use age adjustment. By age adjustment, I mean taking into account that the population in a given country, its age structure changes over time. And typically in high income countries, it becomes an older population actually with surprisingly substantial changes over a small uh, distance in time. Our modeling estimates are 2.2 million deaths without age adjustment, but less than 1.5 million deaths with age adjustment. So you have estimates for the very best quality data locations that vary from 1.5 to 2.8 million, you know, like twofold apart. Let's take a look at Germany. Uh, which is a country that has extremely good death registration, probably the best quality data in the world. And uh, again, try, let's try to calculate excess deaths in 2020, 2021. Our age adjusted estimate is 43,000 excess deaths. Without age adjustment, we calculate 117,000 excess deaths. Lancet calculated 203,000 excess deaths. Uh, Elife, 88,000. Economist, 113,000. Another paper uh, recently released by Baum calculated only 22,000 with age adjustment. Another paper recently released uh, on Germany calculated 130,000 roughly excess deaths without age adjustment. And the recorded number of deaths in these two years is 111,000. So you see about tenfold difference in the country that has the best quality data. In Germany, the number of people aged over 80 increased from 4.6 million in 2016 to 5.8 million in 2020. And we know that people who are older when it comes to COVID-19, we have an exponential function of risk. So consideration of age, I think, is immensely crucial. And once you start adjusting for age, the number of excess deaths goes down tremendously. And in fact, if we could adjust in more granular age intervals, probably it would go to even lower levels. Countries with death deficit during 2020, 21. Of the 33 high income countries without age adjustment, we have Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, and Iceland. They have a death deficit in these two years, less than in previous years. With age adjusted calculations, we have more countries that have a death deficit in 2020, 2021. They include Norway, Denmark, Finland, but also Sweden and South Korea. Most of the 33 high income countries had no notable excess deaths in 2020, 2021 for deaths in people less than 65 years old. US is a notable exception. Age adjusted estimate of excess deaths for 2020, 2021 is 817,000 with excess deaths in both 
less than 65 and more than 65 years old data actually with a very high percentage of the excess deaths being in people less than 65. Let's take a look at the ratio of excess deaths to recorded COVID-19 deaths, because this is where we might learn a little bit more. I, I mean, we have recorded all these deaths and all these cases one by one, but do we learn more by looking at the excess death? The R values range in these different evaluations was within 0.3 only for one of the 33 countries. There is Chile that had ranges of R from 0 0.8 to 1.1. In 18 of the 33 countries with the most reliable data, the range of R across different evaluations exceeded one. This means it was as large as the number of recorded COVID-19 deaths itself. So, you know, the, the noise was bigger than the signal. Only five countries, all of them in Eastern Europe, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Holland, and Slovakia, they had consistently R values more than one, which means more the excess deaths than recorded COVID-19 deaths with all empirical evaluations. And conversely, three countries, Australia, New Zealand, and Taiwan had consistently R values less than one. Most countries, 25 out of 33, had some calculations that would suggest that excess deaths are greater than COVID-19 deaths and other calculations that would suggest that excess deaths are smaller, fewer than COVID-19 deaths. Counting even deaths is not easy. Uh, this is a, an algorithm and a nomogram that I generated in a paper published uh, several months ago last summer in the European Journal of Epidemiology. I tried to think about the concept of how often do we overcount and how often do we undercount COVID-19 deaths? And basically that algorithm con considers the testing, the mortality, the fatality rate, and other features of the population and the way that we approach the diagnosis of putting a stamp on a death as being COVID-19 death. And you see lots of color and very different color, which means that it can be all over the place. If uh, you see, um, color that is uh, uh, red, this means uh, overcounting, tremendous overcounting. If you see gray color, this means undercounting, it can be substantial un uh, or major undercounting. I think that most likely we have had both over and undercounting in different countries and in different locations. Even in the same country, in some phases with very limited testing, we may have had substantial undercounting and in other durations or periods or settings in that same country, we may have had substantial overcounting of COVID-19 deaths. We can learn that much from deaths. How about the healthcare system, especially for clinicians who are at the front line and fighting heroically? It's important to know because this is not fake. That was a major pandemic. It was a major crisis. We saw many hospitals that were, that were stressed in, in different locations. So I think an interesting metric is to try to see how much pressure was there on the health system in different countries and different locations. And this is uh, one metric that I tried to come up with. This is the months with COVID-19 uh, ICU beds taking 25% or more of the total uh, compared to the pre-pandemic capacity of ICU beds uh, in that country. Now, pre-pandemic capacity was increased in many countries because people realized that we have a crisis so we need to have more beds in the ICUs and more ventilators. So if anything, uh, the percentage of COVID-19 occupancy would be less compared to these figures. But I think it's fair to say that uh, how does it compare against uh, what we had when that crisis hit? These are data from countries that have uh, fairly reliable data. I have to say that some of them may be wrong. I did my best to compile information in ICU beds, even for high income countries. And I have to say that there's difference in definitions, there's differences in recording and capturing uh, these types of beds. So some of these numbers are not as accurate as they seems here, but roughly what that slide shows is that if you take the period from November of 2020 until May of 2021, uh, so roughly the late fall and uh, winter and early spring, which is the high risk period, we had three months on average in 2021 that we were above the 25% uh, occupancy by COVID-19. In 21-22, it was just one month. And of course, 
we still have made to go, but uh, currently I think none of these countries are above 20% uh, or let alone 25% of their ICU beds uh, capacity being occupied by COVID-19. So unless we have a, a new surge of a major wave, I think it's unlikely to increase any further. How about measures? Um, measures were taken uh, aggressively or less aggressively in some cases. Uh, lockdown became a very familiar word uh, that many people espoused and other people hated. What is lockdown? It's a composite of about uh, 60,000 different measures. <laughs> Some of them may be effective, others may be ineffective or, or very harmful, but uh, this wonderful team at Oxford has come up with this stringency index that is trying to compile different features of restrictive measures and gives us a uh, uh, an average of the totality. So this is what the situation looked like in late March, about a month ago. And you see lots of red color around the world. So if you say a pandemic ends when we have no measures, that's clearly not the case yet. We have many countries that had very, very stringent measures. And even when I last checked, uh, this is uh, data from uh, two days ago, uh, you see again, some countries having very strict measures some even more strict compared to a month ago. We have uh, China, for example, with uh, Shanghai leading uh, something extraordinary. Uh, you've probably seen all these news about uh, how draconian the lockdown is and uh, what that means for uh, the citizens in, uh, in this uh, large city. So if we say that a pandemic is ended when there's no measures, that's nowhere near to that situation. But of course, we need to ask which of these measures really make sense and, and should we really continue with these measures and are we really saving lives or are we compounding the situation and making some things worse? Lots of people are interested in COVID-19. Uh, of course, uh, everyone in the world has been interested in COVID-19 and science and scientists could not be different. Uh, actually, we had a massive COVIDization of science during the last two years. This is a paper that we published a few months ago uh, in the Royal Society of Open Science, uh, where we mapped the growth of the scientific workforce authoring peer-reviewed scientific papers on COVID-19. These are data by August 1st, 2021, and I'm showing you the growth from February 2020 uh, moving forward. And uh, there's just tremendous growth over time. All scientific fields, 174 scientific fields to which science is divided have experts who have published on COVID-19. The last field to fall was automobile engineering. Automobile engineers uh, joined the fray in November of uh, 2020, and uh, they didn't publish on automobile engineering. They, they published on COVID models. This means that 98 out of the top 100 most cited scientific articles published in 2020 were on COVID-19. Tens of thousands of scientists received more citations to their work in 2020, 2021 than they had received in their entire career. Among the top 100 ranked scientists across science for their work in 2020, 2021, 70 were on health sciences more than in previous years. And most, 57 out of 70, had risen to such extremely high ranks even though they did not belong to the top 1000 ranked in the two previous years. 12 of the 70 actually did not go through peer review at all. They were editors or journal staff who published profusely, sometimes more than 100 pieces in their high profile journals, of course, mostly on COVID-19. The massive funding of COVID-19 research will make reversal of science COVIDization very difficult, even after the end of the pandemic, if we define the end of the pandemic somehow. Most of that research was very weak, biased, low standards, low quality. I guess my research is always as bad, <laughs> but there's many empirical evaluations that uh, show that methodological quality suffered in the COVID-19 era. Uh, if you compare COVID-19 papers compared to other papers uh, published in the same journals, they were of lower quality standards. Uh, people were trying to do their best. It was a all hands on deck kind of situation. So not trying just to blame anyone here, but uh, this probably made a difference on how we dealt with science and the repercussions of science from COVID-19. Of course, we had some extreme cases of uh, even fraud. The, the classic example was uh, this paper that was retracted uh, by The Lancet. Uh, and uh, uh, the first uh, author 
had never seen the data that were supposedly coming from 671 hospitals around the world that had no clue that data were being compiled. Of course, no data had been compiled on uh, this uh, project. Forecasting and modeling uh, was another big occupation of uh, the scientific literature. In the early days, massively, the scientific literature was uh, uh, invaded by modeling. And I think that unfortunately we failed. Uh, that includes my efforts at modeling. Again, I'm not trying to blame anyone. It's extremely difficult to model something that is so unstable, but unfortunately modeling did rule the world. It was the key driver for most of the important decisions and it was the wrong driver for most of the important decisions that were made. Why were we so wrong? Uh, this is a list of factors. Poor data, unfortunately, we depended on models that are very fine grained, but the data were horrible. Uh, so uh, for theory-based forecasting, we had very wrong assumptions. For data-based forecasting, our data were even worse, especially if you think of cases, for example, in the early days that were vastly underdocumented, wrong assumptions in the modeling, high sensitivity in the estimates, uh, lack of incorporation of epidemiological features. Uh, for example, most of the models did not consider the, the very simple uh, age gradient in risk of fatalities or severe disease that is so characteristic of COVID-19. Poor past evidence, we had to go back to 1918 to see what interventions had we tried. Did interventions, yes, and what did they show? Goodness, uh, I mean, you believe this data? I, I think that you have to be very brave to believe that uh, uh, we can use observational data from 1918 Spanish flu to extrapolate what we should do for COVID-19. Lack of transparency. Um, most models did not have even their data and code being shared. We have looked at 1,338 uh, infectious disease models published in the last uh, couple of years and only 14%, one out of seven, share their code and data. Errors, it's very easy to make errors in this setting. Lack of determinacy without uh, consideration of uncertainty. Looking also at only one or a few dimensions of the problem at hand, just looking at cases rather than looking at multiple dimensions of health and impact that uh, our measures in the pandemic could be having. Lack of expertise in, in crucial disciplines. Many of these models were done by people who were not trained in epidemiology, clinical epidemiology, evidence-based medicine. They did their best, but if you try to work on this field and your field is cosmology or automobile engineering, it's not very easy. Group thing and bandwagon effects reinforced by social media and media was a very strong narrative on some of the aspects of how the pandemic was, uh, was handled. And finally, selective reporting. Uh, models are not pre-registered. I have published a paper in uh, Mathematical Bio and Sciences a few months ago where I argue that models, some aspects of them can be registered, they can be pre-registered, but that's not really what happened, we, which means that models could be published to force whatever people believe. Uh, this is one classic example of uh, one of the most influential papers uh, during the pandemic done by an amazingly competent team of um, amazing scientists in Imperial College. Their paper in Nature showed that uh, the first wave draconian lockdown saved more than 3 million lives in Europe. And it was specifically draconian lockdown that made that difference, was not other less restrictive measures, for example, banning big events uh, or uh, trying to achieve some uh, self-isolation and some social distancing. However, Imperial College, along with this model, had also generated another model that they had applied not to European countries, but to US, to, to states. And that was available at the same time as the Nature paper was published. So we looked at both models and we realized that in Europe, the model that had not been published in Nature had much better fit to the data compared to the one that had been published in Nature. And that much better fit model showed that draconian lockdown had no benefit compared to less disruptive uh, approaches. So to me, I think this is one of the most influential situations of selective reporting in the history of science. Could we have done better? I, I said that models were a heroic effort, uh, but under very different difficult circumstances. 
I think we could have done more randomized trials. Uh, we could have done randomized trials on social distancing interventions, uh, and we did a few. We have done about 30 uh, across uh, the entire scientific community compared to more than three, 4,000 that we did on medications and biologics. And I think we could have done more. We have two trials that have been published on masks, for example, they were very useful to do. And of course, people may debate about the results. I'm one who reads them as masks do work, that they have a modest benefit, but others may disagree. But at least we have randomized trials. And I think we should have had more than that. Um, we had great successes with large randomized trials. I would say maybe they were the greatest success story of the pandemic research, even when they failed to show benefits for many of the treatments being assessed. Recovery and solidarity investigators are my heroes for what they did and how they could get these results within just a few months of launching these large adaptive trials. Meta-analysis also could have been useful. Negative results uh, were highly informative for evidence reversals, to use the language that uh, Vinay loves. Uh, my team did a number of meta-analysis using data that we compiled from investigators on different interventions, including convalescent plasma, uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, hydroxychloroquine in our meta-analysis in Nature Communication showed an increased mortality, statistically significant increase in mortality compared to the control arm in uh, the compilation of all the randomized trials that contributed data to our collaboration. And of course, one might argue that maybe that's just uh, for the trials and their population, which is mostly advanced disease and severe disease rather than early uh, asymptomatic or let alone preventive where things might be different. But I think this is a very strong signal. And eventually it could be that hydroxychloroquine killed uh, a large number of people, especially when used in settings that would have no benefit. Personalized risk. Personalized risk pretty much translates to infection fatality rate. What, what is my risk of dying or uh, having to be hospitalized uh, if uh, I get infected? Uh, so there was tremendous debate about this, and I think that debate is wonderful. Data were very poor and sketchy in the beginning. Currently, we have more than 3,000 seroprevalence studies that we can use uh, with their limitations and caveats to estimate infection fatality rate. I think that more or less we are reaching some consensus. Uh, I think that the initial discrepancy on the range of infection fatality rates that were generated has shrunk considerably. I think that uh, the most reliable estimates uh, are talking about infection fatality rates in the range of 0.1 to 0.3% uh, uh, in the pre-vaccine era. And of course, in the, in the vaccination era, you have to divide that by perhaps five or, or more to get to even lower. And not just for the average person, but also for different segments of the population, it was very important to understand what their risks of death uh, would be uh, and ask, do we have specific people who need to protect more than others? Uh, so we're talking about focus protection or what I call precision shielding, meaning can we protect, for example, nursing home residents who have a tremendous risk of death compared to the general population and avoid these massive deaths that would occur there? Uh, or did we do very poorly? And actually these people got infected more than the general population. And unfortunately, in many countries, including the US, uh, we didn't do very well. And actually in many cases we did extremely badly, we did the opposite. We, we had much higher infection rates, especially in the first and second waves in nursing homes compared to the general population. This is uh, standard knowledge now, extremely steep age gradient of risk uh, for someone who has been uh, working on precision science for many years and uh, believing in risk uh, ratios of 1.3, seeing risk ratios of 10,000 in the case of COVID-19 was a revelation. I think it's very difficult to think of other examples where the risk changes 10,000 fold if you compare children versus uh, nursing home residents, uh, for example, but this is what we were facing in, in this case. And uh, even in the elderly, it seems that our early estimates were exaggerated. Uh, for example, this is a paper that we published uh, recently in the European Journal of Epidemiology with Catherine Axworth, looking at all the national unbiased, as unbiased as they can be, data on community dwelling elderly populations. The infection fatality rate was four times lower than previously thought for the main uh, pandemic planning uh, decisions, about 2.2% in those more than 70 years old in high income countries, probably much less in uh, low uh, or middle income countries. 
infection fatality rate in Everest was devastating in nursing home residents, about 30%. But people who die seem to have had life expectancy five to 10 times lower than age and sex national life tables and aspirational life tables would suggest. Uh, these are data that we generated uh, with Marcel uh, Ballin and Peter Nordstrom and his team using the national Swedish databases. And I'm showing you here the risk of death after infection versus control nursing home residents. And you see that there's a tremendous surge in the first few days after infection. But once these people survive, they have very limited risk of dying and gradually they catch up within a few months with the control group of those who were uninfected. This is plotting the hazard ratio for death in infected nursing home residents in Sweden. You see the peak 20 fold increase in risk within the first couple of weeks. And then within about a month, it goes back to baseline. And after the first and second month, it goes below baseline. It's half the risk of death compared to the typical nursing home residents. So it means that people who had very limited life expectancy, just a few months, were those who were unfortunately devastated. But, but then once uh, those who survived that had much less uh, risk of death uh, for the next uh, eight months. This is plotting uh, results on this personal risk, the infection fatality risk age gradient uh, from different evaluations. You can see that our data that use updated and more complete information show much lower risk, uh, even in the elder uh, groups uh, uh, for uh, more than 60 or more than, than 70. Uh, for children and adolescents, uh, pretty much everyone agrees it's in the range of 0.001%. For people 60 to 70, I think, the best estimate is somewhere in the range of 0.5% uh, if you talk of uh, people who are in the community. And as I said, vaccination, even though uh, its uh, immunity uh, support may be waning in terms of protecting from infection, it's still very powerful for protecting from death. Uh, so you need to decrease these numbers probably by fivefold or more. Vaccination and the advent of effective vaccines, I think one was one of the very positive surprises on how quickly we could do that. I think that uh, it was amazing that we had vaccines that were effective, uh, being developed and being possible to distribute very quickly. Although I have to say that we still did very poorly in terms of equity and lots of disadvantaged populations did not have access to vaccines. Going forward, we need to think about how can we estimate effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines, not in the clear cut cases like uh, you have someone who's uh, elderly or, or middle aged uh, individual unvaccinated, uh, a huge benefit, but let's say someone who had three doses and now we're thinking about a fourth dose or perhaps next year or, or 10 years down the road, someone who had eight doses and now we're thinking about the ninth dose, who knows what would be the question of interest at, at that time. And we have to be very careful because most of the data, almost all the data that we have come from non-randomized studies. And this is a, a paper that will take me probably two hours to go through, but I'm trying to dissect all the factors that go into affecting the estimates of vaccine effectiveness in observational data. So you have to consider pre-existing immunity, vaccination misclassification, exposure differences, uh, issues that uh, are induced by perceived vaccine protection and pre-existing carried forward, testing that is typical of diagnosis bias, uh, uh, affecting uh, treatment, uh, disease risk factor confounding, hospital admission decisions, uh, or induced by perceived vaccine protection, uh, treatment use differences, uh, and death attribution. And these factors can lead to two things. One is genuine modification of the effectiveness of vaccines or spurious biased estimates. And we need to differentiate between these two. So that same paper lists a number of options of what we could do to try to sort that out, uh, including registration, sharing of raw data and code, better data collection, reliable information and in prevalence, exposures, testing, disease risk factors, risk profiles, hospital admission, use of treatment, blinded assessments of outcomes, for example, death causes, better designs. There are some options, but they're not perfect. They each have their caveats. Uh, we can use some of the classic epidemiology like multivariable analysis, propensity analysis, uh, or other matching. Uh, we can use uh, some other 
observational designs that are fit for purpose specifically for vaccines, but none of them, I think, should replace randomized trials moving forward, especially when we talk about questionable and subtle effects as opposed to the big effects that we had when we faced, now we have a vaccine, what do we do? Go ahead and vaccinate. Now that we have all these very subtle questions, I think that we need to step back and think of doing more randomized trials. And of course, along with randomized trials, do living reviews and meta-analysis and also try to communicate what we know and what we do not know, both about relative and absolute metrics of risk, uh, presentation of the uncertainty, and avoiding exaggeration, communicating results to the general public. Overall, I think that vaccines are an amazing development, but uh, as we move forward, we should not exaggerate because it will backfire. We, we promise too much and we don't deliver. I think that then uh, we will be giving uh, a bonus to anti-vaxxers and they will say, here it is, your vaccines do not work. For example, this is an early paper that I published in 2021, trying to model the impacts of uh, risk compensation. People who get vaccinated, they feel that they're uh, free to regain their life, which is what they're supposed to do and then they increase their exposures. If uh, you have effectiveness of 60% or even 80% risk compensation could really dramatically decrease the effectiveness for transmission and uh, you will see propagation of new waves. Even though people are still protected uh, from, from death, you will see massive epidemic waves. And this is exactly what we saw in the case of uh, uh, Delta and uh, Omicron. This is uh, some other work that I, uh, I have been working recently on con conditional vaccine effectiveness, I think in terms of communicating to people and appeasing their fears. So when they hear about the vaccines do not work any longer, we can tell them that yes, uh, it's not that you will protect it highly from the risk of getting the virus, but even if you get the virus, your risk of death is going to be very low. And, and this is a concept that I have introduced of conditional vaccine effectiveness. What is your risk reduction for a severe outcome like death compared to uh, if you already have a less severe outcome like having been infected. And this stays pretty high in most of these cases. And of course there's factors and moderators that may affect the calculations of that conditional vaccine effectiveness that we can use to be better communicators of uh, what we are offering to the population. Personal risk seems to be very low for the vast majority of the population nowadays. Uh, after uh, going through the basic epidemiology and after having vaccines uh, developed, I think that we are in a position to tell people that your risk with few exceptions is extremely low. However, there's distorted personal risk perception. I think that this is very important. For example, in the US, a third of the population has believed that more than half of infected people require hospitalization. And conversely, the risk of hospitalization among documented cases was about 7% and 3% during the Delta and Omicron waves. And if you think of two to four fold anti reporting, the risk of hospitalization after infection was probably one to 2%. Also, on average, the US population believed in early 2021 that 8% of deaths had occurred in people younger than 24 years, while the true percentage was about 0.1% at that time, and it's 0.3% by early 2022. In another survey in Austria, children and adolescents believe that they had a 1.2 to 3.3% risk of hospitalization within a year, which is more than a thousand fold higher than reality. They also thought that their parents will die any day because of COVID-19. So we need to remove that distorted personal risk perception. We need social media and media to do this. We need to instill a sense of multidimensionality, both at the personal and public decision making level because it's not just COVID. There's many other things that can go wrong with a pandemic and with our responses to the pandemic, including people who don't go to the hospital, who don't have healthcare or healthcare is stopped for many other non-COVID aspects, uh, delayed treatment, delayed prevention, other healthcare disruption, suicides, violence, starvation, tuberculosis, childhood diseases because of disruption of vaccination programs, alcohol and other diseases of despair, chronic diseases that are not taken care of and lack of proper medical care, we have a lot of things to think about. And we need to think very carefully because all of that is happening in an environment of rising inequalities. High income countries, especially the US, have a major problem with injustice, social injustice, inequalities, disadvantaged populations. We have marginalized a very large number of people and I think during COVID-19, we marginalized even more. This is the worst recipe for public health. And I think we need to find very uh, 
efficient ways to reverse uh, all the damage that has been done. This means that media and social media need to work in this direction. We had tremendous coverage of COVID-19 in media and some of that possibly was helpful, but other was probably exaggerated. Uh, we also had extreme interest in social media. There's a database that until the end of 2021 included 2.2 billion relevant tweets on COVID-19. I think we all need to see how people will use these resources to try to get to some uh, more evidence-based approach towards the pandemic and its aftermath. Devastation of the economy and of social cohesion and the inadvertent boosting of inequalities uh, is something that we see. We see every day. We see in our communities, just have to walk down the street to see uh, people who are homeless, who are unemployed. Uh, you have to just uh, look at our friends and, and people who we know who suffer mentally, who suffer financially uh, because of the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. Inflation, even before the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, had reached decade historical highs, uh, many decades actually, in the US and Europe and uh, also Australia and, and New Zealand. The devastation is worse for the poor countries and for the poor and disadvantaged in high income countries. And devastation of economy and society may result in many times more lives destroyed than SARS-CoV-2 can achieve. Dysfunctional health systems are major contributors to death. Uh, even before the pandemic, we knew that 21% uh, of premature deaths in men and 30% of premature deaths in women in the OECD countries can be attributed to dysfunctional health systems. In low and middle income countries, the situation is horrible. We're talking about almost 9 million deaths per year attributed to poor health care or non-use of health services. And the pandemic just made these deficits more visible and uh, uh, more impactful. Lots of other things are ravaging our world. Uh, smoking, for example, um, almost 10 million deaths per year from smoking, 1 billion deaths expected in the next century, half of them less than 70 years old. Two out of three people who die, uh, if they smoke, they die from smoking, from a reason that is related to smoking. Half of COVID-19 deaths may be due to underlying diseases due to smoking. The tobacco industry is a one trillion behemoth growing during the pandemic at two plus percent per year. And actually with a reputational push by the tobacco industry during the pandemic, a fierce reputational push, sometimes ridiculous. In, in Greece and some other countries, Philip Morris donated ventilators you know, and, and the authorities accepted them and said, wonderful, the tobacco industry has social responsibility. This is completely amazing. Uh, this is uh, one book that I wrote that will be coming out shortly as a book in, uh, in English. And the original version was published in 2014. Uh, now the updated version has a second book that goes to 2022. And I discuss among many other things, uh, how tobacco industry manipulated things during the pandemic, including even some of the reputational attacks that I received that perhaps many of them actually stem from the tobacco industry. But you need to read the book for that. <laughs> Along with Prabhadza, we suggested that this is an opportunity to eliminate the tobacco industry. Eventually, SARS-CoV-2 may be a covert blessing, helping to save up to 1 billion deaths over the next century if we do that. And there's other things that we have to work on. We need to work on education. 90% of students around the world had their education disrupted. Data from the Netherlands, which is a country with the best infrastructure and capacity for tele-education, show that during the lockdown, Students learn next to nothing, and the poorest students regress 60% more than wealthy students. As a paper in PNAS, according to UNESCO, 24 million students, including 8 million studying universities, will not be able to return to their studies after the pandemic. We see that already happening. Can we make a real difference? We have to think big. We have to think about how we can affect factors that really underline the massacre that we saw with COVID-19. We need to fight social injustice, inequalities, racism, poverty. I mentioned smoking. There's other modifiable risk factors in lifestyle. Obesity is a very strong risk factor for mortality in COVID-19. Poor protection of nursing homes. That was a derangement that was ongoing in many countries that shifted nursing homes to a business environment where people were just trying to make money out of it with very little care actually for elderly people. Poor adoption of effective public health measures. We have to work on that. We need to work on building trust for public health. How are we going to avoid the adoption of harmful pro-contagion public health measures? For example, blind draconian lockdowns. I see what's happening in Shanghai and I'm really, really concerned. Suboptimal and harmful treatments and medical care. We had many that had to be removed, hopefully after 
randomized trials like solidarity and uh, recovery. And finally, how can we have more effective vaccination? How can we build on the efficiency of our vaccination strategies and not make them polarized, not make them political statements? Because if we make them political statements, then we can only hope to vaccinate those who belong to that particular political statement. We need to tell everyone that here's something that is beneficial for everyone or give them the risk benefit ratio so that they can decide. Final comments, the COVID-19 pandemic ended long ago or it may never end. It depends on us. I think that public health officials in countries that don't have a problem right now should say that the pandemic has ended. The next pandemic may occur in a few months or in more than 100 years. Nobody knows when. There can be both optimistic and pessimistic scenarios. And here's one optimistic scenario that expects that SARS-CoV-2 will paradoxically kill billions of people eventually. How can this be optimistic? Well, that optimistic scenario, which of course I'm completely uncertain if it will come to pass, SARS-CoV-2 remains an endemic virus. It continues to be the dominant seasonal virus for influenza-like illness, while influenza remains in recession. Its variants continue to be in the same range of pathogenicity as Omicron. Thus, its infection fatality rate, especially for those vaccinated or previously infected, is much lower than the infection fatality of influenza. Public health is trusted by the population and non-disruptive measures are used. Humanity does not succumb to existential threats such as climate change and nuclear war and survives for millions of years. Over these millions of years, SARS-CoV-2 kills billions of people, but far fewer than influenza would have killed. We need to be prepared because we don't know when the next pandemic will be. As I said, it would be in a few months, could be in a few months. This means though that pandemic preparedness should not disrupt life. Conversely, we should improve living conditions and opportunities, especially for those who are in need and who are disadvantaged. We need to build and maintain trust in public health. We need to see the big picture and not lose track of the big picture. Last slide with just a few of the much larger number of hundreds of amazing colleagues uh, who worked with me during the pandemic uh, in some of the papers that I shared with you and in others that I didn't have time to discuss. I have learned from all of them and from more. I have learned from people who agreed with me. I have learned even more from people who have disagreed. A million thanks. Oh, thank you so much, John. That was... Uh really riveting. And I think uh, there was a lot of food for thought. I will take questions from people, but I first wanted to um, talk to give you one question to get your thoughts on this issue. Um, um, and then I have a lot of questions on different parts, but we'll see what people have to think say first. Um, so I guess my the first question I have for you is, you know, right now, I think there are a number of surveys that suggest that um, trust in authority, expertise, public health has undergone something of an evolution. And uh, some surveys suggest that it's on the decline. And uh, there are many potential culprits. One culprit is, of course, that there's always going to be a faction of people who say things that are just really incorrect, like, uh, I don't know, Wi-Fi networks caused COVID-19. But, um, and, and I, certainly, I, certainly don't, I certainly don't give them much credence. But, but I'm a little concerned sometimes with the heavy handedness of public health. And I wonder your thoughts on, you know, um, when authority or institutions use their power, uh, they should use it wisely. But we've seen a number of universities have done something like for a 20 year old college man who's had two doses of vaccine and just had Omicron, if they don't get that third dose, the booster within 30 days of the last infection, you know, they're going to be disenrolled. And I don't want to specifically say which university on this Bay Area, but they actually that's it's one of those places as well. Um, so I guess my question to you is, what do you feel like, you, you know, public health authorities have made missteps by potentially overusing their power for potentially a low value intervention, like making sure a 20 year old who had two doses and Omicron gets boosted. What are your thoughts on this? So I, I think that many mistakes have been made uh, during the pandemic on public health issues, on epidemiology. Uh, I consider myself uh, a, a champion of mistakes. So <laughs> I, I'm not saying this to blame uh, particular people uh, of, uh, or you've made more mistakes than, than others. Uh, it has been a very difficult situation. Uh, it's very difficult to balance preferences, fears, risks, evidence, perceptions, politics, uh, uh, beliefs. It, it's, it's just a conglomerate. My only recommendation is 
can we lower the tone of, of the discussion? You know, ca ca can we uh, try to be a little bit more calm? Uh, can we avoid excess? Can we avoid uh, excess pressure, excess coercion, excess uh, aggression, excess complaint, excess blame, excess deaths <laughs> eventually? Um, so, so I'm I'm against excess, <laughs> and and in in that regard, I think that discussion, I think that using a more participatory type of approach for public health, thinking about how can we convince. And that means that you try to win over people to your side. And this means that your side must be something that can be acceptable. It cannot be excessive. It, it, it cannot be something that is uh, just uh, uh, making a ridicule of, of people, is, is, is putting their lives uh, in, in the corner and, and, and making them feel very uneasy that you know, they will be expelled, they will be marginalized, they will lose their job, they will uh, face uh, other kind of, of, of consequences. Uh, I think that um, a, a, a more inclusive approach and trying to think, well, even if we know the truth, which as you know, in science, we never know 100% the truth, let alone in a crisis that's so rapidly evolving, how do we convince more people about it? Uh, we're not gonna convince people just by uh, embracing those who agree with us uh, and say, you're the good people and, and demonizing those who have objections, who, who, you know, who don't want to have that extra dose, who, you know, who don't want to do something that we're telling them. Uh, it, it is that second group that we need to work with, not with our friends or, or those who already agree with us. And I think that what has gone wrong in many public health efforts is that uh, uh, public health has tried to maximize adherence among those who are already 100% adherent <laughs> and, and, and create public enemies for those who are not adherent. And, and those people then will never adhere because then it becomes a life or death, you know, my worldview versus your worldview, only one will survive. <laughs> That's well put. Any questions from people? I see. Logan, I see you want to talk. Timothy, Christina? Uh, okay. Yeah. Chris, can Timothy, Christina, you go first, uh, and then we'll go Christina, and then Logan put you Okay. On. Okay, and then Logan, okay. Uh, Okay, thank you very much. First, um, it was a really wonderful uh, uh, all this work you have done, really impressive. Um, I have a question, more maybe more philosophic, philosophical question. Um, do we have any example in history of n not of other pandemics, but of other measures going to, with the pandemic that have such consequences like we have nowadays? And could we learn from this past example? Do, do we have a, I don't know, maybe in uh, antiquity or in other period, do we have other examples of uh, that kind of reaction? I think that uh, historians uh, would be uh, very useful to tell us what we know and uh, what uh, we have recorded in history over the years in, in different pandemics. and. Uh, I, I, I love history. I, I try to read uh, history books uh, when I, whenever I have spare time. And of course, lots of crazy things and lots of overreactions and lots of um, measures that were not evidence-based have been adopted by medicine and public health uh, over the years. Uh, it, it's uh, like a, a list of almost exclusively non-evidence-based measures <laughs> that were used. The, the, the question is, how do you compare aggressiveness? How do you compare disruption? How do you compare uh, impact uh, when we have societies and civilizations and uh, communities that are so different in the plague of 1348 or even in Spanish flu of 1918. Uh, th these are very different settings and very different uh, communities and very different populations and very different perceptions about uh, what human life is and why it matters and how we need to defend it and, and how community uh, uh, should operate. So we can learn from history, but each time it is different. And uh, I, I think that we need to collect evidence as evidence arises <laughs> and as, as the demand of evidence arises. Uh, if, if, if we have a new variant in the next two months, we need to collect data for that variant. I cannot generalize that you know, Omicron would seem to be less of a problem compared to, let's say, Delta 
who knows what the next variant will be. So, so learning from history is useful. And the one lesson is that most measures that we have used in medicine, public health has have been devastatingly wrong. Uh, but <laughs> we always hope that we can do better this time and hopefully moving forward. Christina. Thank you. Um, just echoing, just echoing Timothy, thanks so much for being here. I'm, uh, I followed the Theranos uh, saga very closely, so it's definitely a treat to have you here and hear from you. Um, but um, I just had a question about the excess deaths um, and the death deficit um, in some of the countries. So I, I, as a background, spent half the pandemic in New Zealand, and I think it was New Zealand, Taiwan, and Australia that had a death deficit. And now there are people out there right now that are still arguing that you know their measures, the COVID zero approach is effective. And by me with naive eyes, I see that and or see that they had a death deficit and is, could you extrapolate within that period of time and say what they did maybe worked? And I know that's a subjective measure because it depends, <laughs> but how do you, I guess, interpret that death deficit in those countries compared to other countries? Certainly, I, I, this is the, the holy grail uh, question. Uh, and <laughs> here I will go back to history and the best data that we have from 1957 and 1968 suggests that the mortality rates in the population level differed 70 fold across different locations around the world. 70 fold, you know, close to a, a two digit log 10 scale. Um, so why is that? Uh, I wish I knew. <laughs> I, I think that there is a very strong chaotic element in uh, why some locations are more hard hit than others. Some of that can be explained. Uh, for example, Australia and New Zealand, they're islands in the middle of, uh, of nowhere practically compared to New York, uh, which is uh, connected with uh, you know, more connections than any other part of the world. So you know, we, we can start rationalizing and explaining and using some ecological variables and throwing in also uh, some of the measures that were being taken. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not opposed to this work. I have done such studies. I have published some, <laughs> such studies, uh, for example, comparing Sweden and South Korea that didn't have aggressive lockdown, but more targeted measures uh, versus other countries that had draconian lockdown and you know, showing that they didn't really do worse in terms of the evolution of, of the caseload. But I have to acknowledge that this is very, very rudimentary evidence because there's so much that is chaos uh, and or unexplained confounding or circumstantial situations that um, uh, it, it's not really possible to compare uh, New Zealand to the US. You know, uh, it, it, there's so many differences in so many ways. And if you try to compare some of the most draconian lockdowns were countries that did the worst, for example, Peru, probably had the, the most draconian lockdown and it's leading the pack in terms of, uh, of fatalities. So what does that mean? Uh, one recipe probably does not fit all. And uh, some countries maybe were just more lucky than others. It, it, it sounds uh, almost abrasive to say so, uh, but that, that's what it boils down to, geography, communications, seeding, viral seeding, some critical first steps perhaps on the dispersion of the epidemic wave might have made a difference regardless of the big components of, of the public health policy. John, um, just to follow up on that, how do you think about, you know, I mean, excess death, one of the, assum I mean, one of the assumptions is that the death would have been the same had it not been for, you know, the virus, but of course people's behavior changed dramatically. So how do we separate you know, the deaths that are caused, the excess deaths due to the virus, the excess deaths due to the virus disrupting the healthcare system so I can't get my, you know, heart attack taken care of. Um, and then the short-term deaths that may be due to the lockdown itself. And then the long-term toxicity of lockdown, which will probably have a toxicity 20 years, 30 years from now, as well as the, you know, immediate toxicity. How does one separate these things? Um, yeah. it, it is not easy. I, as I said, uh, even in the countries that we have the best quality data, for example, the high income countries that have complete death registration, uh, 
even before the pandemic, the literature on death certificates shows that errors and validity in death certificates are a huge problem. Uh, so uh, I, I, again, I'm not saying this to blame people. They're not, they're not doing a good job, but anyone who has been a practicing physician knows how difficult it is to complete an accurate death certificate, especially I can think of my days as a clinician when people would call me at one after midnight and I was you know, trying to put my brain to work and fill out this death certificate. Uh, it's not easy. And, and even if it's nine o'clock in the morning and it's the best of days, you need to go very thoroughly through everything that has happened to try to arrive at the right sequence of what was really the cause and what were other contributing causes. We can learn from autopsies to some extent. We can learn from audits of death certificates. We can learn from audits of medical records. I think we need to do more of that. Uh, there's some of that happening. A uh, series of, de of uh, autopsies suggest that in high income countries, anywhere between 55 to 95% of COVID-19 deaths are indeed due to COVID-19, but this means that five to 45% are not COVID-19, but all of these are highly distorted samples, you know, highly select samples. So uh, I, I think that they're not necessarily representative of the truth. Indirect deaths, they're very difficult to measure. How do you measure deaths due to lack of education, for example? Uh, we know that education is a very strong risk factor for longer survival if you're well-educated or for poorer survival if you're not well-educated. But that will take a century to be able to see the, the full impact. Uh, how do we measure the impact of, of widening inequalities, of making more people marginalized, uh, of, of having people who are unprotected become even more unprotected during the pandemic and especially during lockdown. We had a major opioid crisis that was brewing, actually not just brewing, it, it, it was at a climax just before the pandemic. It just became worse. How much of that are we going to attribute to the pandemic, to the shelter in place, to the measures that we took, to the shift of attention or priorities? Um, all of these are very difficult to model. And I think we just need to keep an an open mind and try to measure as carefully and as accurately as we can all of these dimensions because they all matter. It, it's important to measure lives lost for all reasons, not just COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Logan, you had a question? Yeah, so uh, first off, thank you for being here and talking to us. Um, I guess my question is a little less technical, so I apologize, but uh, you know, how do you get the themes from your presentation from the literature to the general public? Because it seems at the moment that media and policy is dictated by forces much stronger than academia, you know, rather than the traditional investigative journalism that may have been used to cross the two worlds. Um, you know, occasionally we'll get a, a piece in the Atlantic or these online magazines over the past few years that give you some insight on the themes that you portrayed in your talk. But I was kind of wondering what your thoughts are on that. Media are very powerful. Social media are equally powerful. They have been key players in the pandemic and the pandemic response in shaping perceptions in shaping misperceptions in propagating conspiracy theories and propagating counter conspiracy theories and propagating wonderful knowledge and propagating horrible uh, misinformation and disinformation. So as you say, uh, scientific literature is completely outnumbered and outpowered compared to the power that, uh, that these resources have. So it, it sounds very naive to say that they should be used wisely and, uh, and use uh, with caution <laughs> uh, and at your own risk. <laughs> I, I think that um, um, we need a broader discussion about what science is and uh, what can we trust and uh, uh, some broader issues surrounding conflicts uh, are also useful. Some broader issues regarding how policy is shaped, how perceptions are, are shaped, uh, who is running the show, why are they running the show and uh, uh, what kind of poor scientists do. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think that, um, I've, I've never felt more powerless in, in my entire life. I, I always had probably some 
um, some grandiosity to think that I'm a scientist uh, with, with lots of asterisks uh, still, and I'm trying to find evidence. And in the COVID-19 pandemic, I realized, goodness, I'm, I'm just a fool and I'm being tossed right and left uh, by all these much more powerful waves surrounding me. And uh, that's, uh, that's a very difficult situation for science because you, you cannot be tossed around or you should not be tossed around. You should try to do your best to try to the most accurate estimates, try to correct inaccuracies again to, to reach to the most accurate estimate. And you have all these forces out there of journalists and media and superstars and influencers. And uh, uh, most of them have no clue about science, but they just play with science as a toy. Uh, so, so very uneasy situation. Uh, plus all, all the smearing and, and all the reputational devastation. There's surveys that show that a very large number of scientists were, were smeared. Uh, and uh, completely devastated. Uh, and many of them were either censored or self-censored because they just didn't want to mess with, uh, with all that, that huge pandemonium. Any last questions? Uh, is it okay if I jump in? I don't wanna keep them too long though. Yeah, you, you go and then Ben has the last one. Okay. Okay, sorry. I apologize uh, for cutting in terms of the background. I have a sick baby and my wife's out of town. Um, that was a fantastic talk. I just. Uh, also, I want to apologize for my naivety, but in terms of the excess deaths and the age adjustment, um, I guess I don't fully understand that. Is that based on like life expectancy for these individuals? Is it based on you just um, like bracketing in terms of deaths for age? I just I was wondering about that, how age kind of factors in. Obviously, people older are more likely to die from COVID as well as many other diseases, but I didn't quite understand um, yes. how you drop a number from 111,000 down or whatever down to 43,000 for... That. So, so it's, it's uh, basically taking the age bin uh, that has a, a larger population size uh, over time in many countries that are high income because the, there's an aging population. So uh, as I said, in Germany, the number of people over 80 increased within just four years from 4.5 million to 5.8 million. Uh, so people who are over 80 have a much higher risk of death and therefore a much higher number of expected deaths that you expect to see. And if you factor that into account, the number of deaths that you expect to see is much higher for the overall population. Uh, it's, um, it's very simple. Uh, and uh, I, I think that um, it, it means that you need to compare apples with apples. You, you need to compare each bin with the same age bin uh, each time. And you cannot just assume that a population stays the same uh, over time, because th th this is obviously not uh, what is happening, especially for a virus that has such a tremendous age risk rating. Uh, I said that mm -hmm. you know, 10,000 fall different in risk. So if you move some people, some portion of the population to a higher scale of age, then you move them immediately to a much higher risk of, of death uh, in general and also from COVID-19. John, what you're saying is that you know uh, excess death is observed minus expected, and the yes. expected they're using is from like four years ago, five years ago, or even further yes. back. I say they're using yeah, okay. the so, so, five so years you need, ago. So you need to find your your reference frame for the expected, and you can take the previous year, or two years, or three years, or five years, or twenty years, and you can also add seasonality, or you can add uh, linear trends, or you can add both, or you can add other models, uh, and or uh, adjust for death, uh, for, for, for age, uh, for, for the change in the population, and then do the calculations for each age bin that may be changing in the size over time. Gotcha. That makes a lot more sense. I appreciate that. And I guess my one last note is I think, um, you know, COVID in the long run will probably be, as you said, endemic and much more similar to the flu. And I, I think that makes total sense. I think one of the things that's always I, I guess I shocked the population and even me a little bit as a physician is working in the ICU. I've seen a handful of people who are 35 years old, aren't obese, don't have asthma or almost any other comorbidities, weren't vaccinated. Uh, this was before that or shortly after that, and are now on ECMO and awaiting a lung transplant or things like that, which I never remember seeing from flu really before that. And it just feels like COVID somehow, obviously much more deadly for older people, but even for young people has had this impact no that it could have that was unexpected. 
no doubt you, you can have many such cases that uh, are, are really horrible and uh, talking about millions and billions of, of deaths and statistics does not convey the drama and, and the humanity of each single person, you know, who could be, as you say, a 35 year old with, with no comorbidities in some cases. But uh, I think that we should still try to see the big picture and we should still try to study why we see that and why we see that probably more in some countries compared to others. But for example, the US had a much larger share of excess deaths in younger age groups compared to most European mm. countries. Why did this happen? You know, we need to think about what went wrong in our healthcare system, in our public health system, in, you know, in, in maybe other factors that, that shape our community and our population. That makes sense, thank you. Ben, last question. So first, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, so kind of a broader question. Um, so you kind of touched on how groupthink influenced some of the policies and decisions we made during the pandemic. And like, even in my eyes, I saw it. Um, and so I was curious if you thought, like, if you think groupthink exists throughout like all of medicine and if so, is it like good or bad? And if it's bad, like, what can we do about it? That's a very interesting question. Groupthink does exist across medicine. And uh, I, th I think you can divide it into chronic groupthink and acute <laughs> <laughs> groupthink. So most medicine has chronic groupthink. And uh, I, I have clashed with a number of colleagues, hopefully in friendly terms, because I have my group thing and they have their own group thing. But you know, these are chronic battles that last for many years and decades. And uh, we, we fight for an inch of space <laughs> each time. In, in COVID-19 was acute, massive group thing. And it was not just small scientific specialized communities where I can fight with my fellow uh, epidemiologists to, to death, literally, it was really about death, really about people fearing about death for themselves, for their families, for their friends, uh, and happening in real time, not just with scientists, but with everyone in the game. You know, the entire community, all the politicians, all the media, all the social media, everyone had something to say, everyone had to defend something. And uh, that's very different. It, it, it's one thing to have a clash of group things, which happens all the time in medicine. And it's another thing to have acute group thing in so massive scale. And just to add to that, John, the other thing that I'd never experienced in medicine, and you know, we've been on uh, the um, many quarrels with groupthink on things like cancer screening, and you know, you published your paper on overall mortality and cancer screening, genomics, and 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 how much you're going to get from you know sequencing everyone every day, you know, and these kinds of debates. But the thing that made it unique was one, it touched like so many more people. So you know, everything is like logfold increase in attention. And it quickly became tied to political party. So it brought the group think plus the tribalism of political party. And I'd never been in a PSA debate where I'm only arguing with Democrats or Republicans. At least it was, <laughs> you know, at least it was a urologist bias in both directions. You know, it doesn't just one political party. And I think that made it, you know, more vitriolic and more spiteful. Absolutely. I think that uh, it, it was very unique in that regard. And I hope we do manage to go past that stage because otherwise I'm not very optimistic about uh, how science and, and our societies as a whole would evolve. Well, John, it was a brilliant talk. And I think, you know, everything you've touched on and worked on is obviously important, both in the short term, but also for the historical perspective on what the pandemic is and what it has done. And I hope that, and somebody's typing how amazing it was. And I think that um, uh, people should read your articles. They're each very brilliant. And I think that, you know, um, they're highly original and they're pushing these, this thought in many different directions and people should pick up on it. And if they can try to refute you, they should try to refute you, but hopefully in the peer review literature, uh, I think if they can try, let's see. Um, but uh, thank you so much. And if you like the video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Until next time.